I'm not saying it, but okay. Uh, Cortez and Montezuma, we are reading the book Cortez and Montezuma by Mara Pratt, and we're on the next chapter, chapter three, uh, The Mountaineers. On the mountains, high up in its natural defenses, was the city of Tlus Tlaxcalans. It was an independent city, oops, it was an independent city, not under the rule of Montezuma, having defeated the forces of this great king in two fierce battles. Once, irritated that there should exist in the very midst of his possessions a city so free and independent, he had sent against it a great army commanded by his own son. But the hardy mountaineers, caring no more for a son of Montezuma than for any leader, had fallen upon his forces, killed him, and had pursued his fleeing army far down the mountainside. Again, Montezuma sent forces against these lawless Tlaxcalans. These sweeping through the valley and halfway up the mountainsides were suddenly poured down upon by these Tlaxcalans who had, in, who had hidden in the mountain fastnesses like swarms of insects. Showers of rocks and arrows beat back the struggling Aztecs and they were driven down the mountainside, across the valley, to the very confines of their own city. Wait, Mom, the tax flower means... The tax flowers are new person in the story? New people in the story? Yes, so these are these mountain people. And they're fighting against They fought, well, they... Yeah, so they weren't, like, under Montezuma's rule. You know Montezuma is the king of the Aztecs, the very powerful king with all the gold? Okay, so they're fighting the Aztecs. Well, they're not under Aztec rule. They're not ruled by Montezuma. They're not fighting with him anymore, but they did fight with him in the past. That's what they're talking about here. Who are they rushing down upon them? Well, this is when Montezuma tried to attack them. Because Montezuma tried to make them, you know, his people, like tried to conquer them, but they, they fought back and they weren't able, Montezuma wasn't able to conquer them. Okay? So, never again had Montezuma attempted to subdue these hardy people in open contest. In shutting them off from intercourse with other tribes, he shut them off from certain foods, but these they seemed very little to heed. So there they were, up in their stronghold, happy and contented as far as Montezuma could see, rejoicing in their victory, proud of their independence, and, worst of all, a source of constant irritation and vexatious annoyance to him, their king in name but not in power. It was with delight, therefore, that Montezuma learned that the approaching Spaniards were attempting to pass through the country of the Tlaxcalans. Surely Cortes would be defeated by these people, unless, indeed, they were, as they said, sons of the gods. Imagine, then, the terror and discouragement that fell upon Montezuma when, after days of horrible slaughter between Spaniards and Tlaxcalans, word came that the Tlaxcalans, yes, even the Tlaxcalans, had fallen under the supernatural power of Cortes and his men. Okay, next chapter, we'll go on to the next chapter. It's called Montezuma's Policy. From this time, although Montezuma guarded it from his people, he had little hope for his own city. If those Spaniards had not the help of the gods themselves, he thought, they could never have overcome these Tlaxcalans. And if they have the help of the gods, then what use is it for us to resist? Certainly, this was logical in Montezuma, as a believer in the counsels and prophecies of the oracles. Then why blame him? Why call him weak, as many do? Was he not, after all, true to his teachings? And in trying to save his people from bloodshed and destruction, simply more philosophical, more clear-sighted, and more humane than another king in a similar position would have been, who, believing in his gods, had urged his people on to bloody and fatal resistance? Montezuma now sent messengers again to Cortes, bearing more beautiful and costly presents, and saying that Montezuma would be glad to meet so great a general 
but regretted that the roads leading to the Mexican capital were too rough and dangerous for any army to attempt to pass. More than this, Montezuma was willing to pay an annual tribute to this great Spanish king. Cortes, shrewd man that he was, saw at once that Montezuma was frightened and that, for some reason, he shrank from open contest with him. So, receiving the presents with great show of gratitude and respect, Cortes was only the more courageous to push on into the very city of the great king. As the messengers were going away, they earnestly advised him not to go up into the city of the Tlaxcalans, lest they should be entrapped. These Tlaxcalans, they said, cannot be relied upon. They are treacherous and are quite as likely to have ready a trap as a feast for you in their city. At the same time, the Tlaxcalans, listening eagerly, shook their heads wisely and warned Cortes that Montezuma's people were not to be trusted that Montezuma was never nearer and deeper in evil schemes than when his words seemed softest and his presence finest. Nothing better suited the scheming nature of Cortes than this. With both parties, he pretended the greatest friendship, the greatest gratitude and respect for their timely suggestions. Both parties he dismissed with hearty hand clasp, tears of seeming gratitude, and vows of eternal indebtedness. And each party went away feeling that he was the one whose words had moved Cortez, whose advice and warning Cortez would be sure to heed. Well, Cort yeah? Is Cortez the one that's um, being all nice to each? Person? Yeah, he's being nice to both the Tlaxcalans and Montezuma's people, yeah. Cortes and his officers were received in the Tlaxcalan city with great pomp and ceremony. Here, as in Sempoaya, Cortes rashly attempted to enforce the Spanish religion, and, but for the wisdom of his priest, Father Almedo, who declared that it was worse than useless to try to force a new religion upon any people, would again have brought down upon himself the just anger of these fiery Aztecs. It would seem strange that Cortes, with all his wisdom, should not himself have seen the foolishness and unnaturalness of such a course. But his foolish zeal for demolishing the heathen gods, revered as they were by the people, and setting up his own symbols, seemed to be a weakness of this otherwise shrewd reader of men. After much argument and threatening, in which Cortes seemed likely to lose all he had gained with the Tlaxcalans, he agreed to compromise with them. If they would clear one temple of its abominable trash, as he called it, and give him that to make fit for the worship of his own men, he would, for the present, allow the other temples to remain as they were, and the people to still maintain the traditional faith of their ancestors. Cece, can you do me a favor? Can you go get me a glass of water, please? Yeah, sure. Like a tall glass of water. And can you put, like, three or four drops of minerals in it because I didn't put any in the filter last time. Montezuma, hearing all of this, hearing of all this, was stupefied with fear. These, said he, must indeed be those men who, long ago our oracles prophesied, would come to conquer our country. The fact that Cortes had overcome and was forming an alliance with these Tlaxcalans, his deadly enemies, was to him indeed an omen of no little terror. Something he saw must be done. And so, useless as it almost seemed to him, he sent messengers to Cortes, bidding him to come at once to his city and warning him against forming any alliances with the Tlaxcalans on the way. Thank you. I'm going to put down there. I should turn my time. Okay, it's okay. Are you coming, Cece? Yeah. What? No, it was fine. So anyway, uh, maybe I should reread that. Uh, all right. Well, anyway, Montezuma was very scared when he heard that, like, Cortez was, like, 
you know, staying with the Tlaxcalans and all that. So then he said that uh, he sent like a message telling Cortez to come to his city at once the and warning no him. To go? Yeah, and warning him against forming any alliances with the Tlaxcalans on the way. So on reaching Cholula, which was on his way to the city of Montezuma, the watchful Cortez saw much that aroused his suspicion that all was not above board. The Cholulans, who had pretended to be desirous that Cortez should visit them, behaved very queerly for people assuming to be hosts, and there were hardly provisions enough to satisfy the hunger of the visiting Spaniards. Ambassadors again came to Cortez from Montezuma, telling him that on no account would Montezuma receive him within his city. When these ambassadors had conferred with the Cholulans, Cortez noticed that his men were treated with added indifference. On inspection, he found that the roofs of the houses were loaded with stones, the Mexicans' favorite weapon in battle, that the women and children were being carried outside the city, and that the Cholulans were secretly sacrificing to the god of war. It seems that after Montezuma had sent inviting Spaniards to his city, sorry, it seems that after Montezuma had sent inviting the Spaniards to his city, his oracles had told him that the foe were to meet their fate at Cholula. Faithful to his religion and faith in the oracles, he at once sent troops to Cholula with a report of what the oracles had said, telling them to trap Cortez and his men, reserve 20 of them for sacrifices, and to send the rest to Mexico. In some way, Cortez got a full account of the plot. We will watch, said Cortez, and when I give the signal, be it night or day, spring upon the Cholulans. The night passed quickly. In the morning, the Cholulans seemed unusually active. They assembled, apparently with no cause, in their great square. See, said Cortez, they are about to fall upon us. Be ready for action. Now, if ever, are we to strike the blow that shall help to hew our way to the Aztec capital. Going coolly up to one of the Cholulan chiefs, Cortez said, Know you not that no plot of yours could be concealed from us, the sons of the gods? Then, giving the signal, the killing of the Cholulans began. The Tlaxcalans, who had come with Cortez and who had long hated the Cholulans, joined in the frightful slaughter. The Tlaxcalans, indeed, Cortez was forced to command to stop in their heathenish, butch in their heathenish butchery, so fierce and so full of revenge were they. After the battle, Cortez ordered that the city, so far as possible, be put in its original condition of order and cleanliness, and that the fleeing citizens be requested to return to their homes. The brother of the slaughtered Cholulan Cacique was placed in power, and in a few days the city was as busy and quiet as ever. The news of this quick destruction of the power of Cholula reached Montezuma. So depressed was he with this, following so closely upon the Tlaxcalan victory, that all life and courage left him. For days he shut himself up in his palace, fasting and calling upon the gods to save the country. Cortez, wary as ever, sent word to Montezuma that, although he had been told that Montezuma was concerned in the plot of the Cholulans, he could not believe that so great a monarch would be guilty of so contemptible a scheme. You may be sure that after this, Cortez had always an eye open, as we say, for treachery. Okay. 